to everybody. Good evening to everybody who is present here. Um, Niranjan is there? Hello? Yes, sir. Niranjan sir is there. Ah, okay. Good evening, Niranjan. Good evening, sir. Um, we are, we are, uh, we are, I welcome you all to the morbidity and mortality meeting of this month. Um, there is a very interesting case with the significant amount of uh, learning that we can hopefully um, glean from this uh, case, which has been very well managed. Um, so, um, it is a case of acute appendicitis with gangrene and uh, perforation. So, I think, uh, you know, even to, to, to this date with the significant advances in antibiotics and ICU care and everything, still we have situations where these patients can give us a lot of trouble. Uh, so, you know, a lot of questions about how to manage it, where, where, where can we, you know, change tack and all these things can be, you know, understood by looking at this case. So, Pavan, our second year resident will present the case and um, will stop in between for discussion uh, as and when kindly um, stop for any questions that you want to clarify or you can put your comments in the chat box. Okay, uh, Pavan, start. Thank you, sir. Good evening, everyone. I am Dr. Pavan Kumar, second year DNB resident from Sagar Hospitals. Welcome to this month's mortality and morbidity session. A 57 year old lady, known case of diabetes and hypertension, came to emergency on 19th December 2021 with complaints of pain in the right lower quadrant of abdomen since four days, while on, while on pilgrimage, and pain gets worsened since two days. Patient was initially um, intermittent, patient has initially intermittent type of colicky pain and which is non radiating to back, and then it becomes severe and continuous type. And a history of four to five episodes of non bilious vomiting is present. There was no history of fever with chills and rigors, loss of appetite loss of weight, altered bowel and bladder habits. There was no history of previous uh, surgeries allergic to any medications and history of similar complaints in the past. As a patient is a known case of diabetes and hypertension and she, she was on glimepiride, metformin and voglibos twice daily and tablet uh, Vildagliptin 50 milligrams twice daily and tablet Telmisartan plus hydrochlorothiazide once daily. On general physical examination, patient was conscious and oriented with DCS 15 by 15 and she was moderately built and nourished and there was no paler, icterus, clubbing, cyanosis and lymphadenopathy and vitals of the patient was shown and her Saturation was 80, 86% to 88% at room air and with 2 liters oxygen, she is maintaining saturation 94% with a high sugar levels of 335. On systemic examination, S1, S2 um, was heard with bilateral normal vascular breath sounds and parabdomen was sounded with tenderness in the right iliac fossa with no guarding and rigidity and small umbilical hernia with expansile cough impulse present and bilateral hernia orifice are intact. The blood investigations was done as shown in the slide. There was elevated uh, PTINR, INR, which is 19.1 and 1.45 and APTT 36.5 and ECG showed atrial fibrillation. Okay, go back, go back. Yes, sir. Uh, Indraja, Indraja, are you there? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. With this history and clinical examination, what what do you think is going on with this patient? There is tenderness in the right iliac fossa with no guarding rigidity. There is uh, tachycardia and uh, two four day history of severe abdominal pain, which has become severe. So, what are your thoughts? She is fifty six years of age. Yes, sir. and patient is having pain mostly in the uh, like all over the abdomen and tenderness is there in mostly in the right iliac fossa. Maybe it is a favor of uh, appendicitis, sir. 
and uh, patient is also having the peritonitis features what so peritonitis it is feature? maybe like she is having the uh, tachycardia sir with yeah. a pulse rate of around uh, 110 to 120 per minute 104 they said according to yes. the thing um, yes. there is no guarding rigidity so how will you, how will you say okay. there is peritonitis hmm. hari sir uh, you can't say it peritonitis at this time sir but uh, huh. patient that's uh, uh, maybe because of pain also tachycardia uh, huh. maybe because of pain only so right. yes sir just one clarification there there was rebound tenderness hmm. ah yes rebound tenderness but more tenderness in ri with rebound tenderness in yes. ri yeah other thing is uh, already the you know if you look at it the saturations are 86 to 88 which indicates that there is already patient going into uh, organ dysfunction if not organ failure is it not correct yes sir kavya yes sir uh, good evening dr shanai sir Pro professor shanai thank you very much for joining us uh, good evening good evening namaskara namaskara sir so yeah. what are the other that's why i wanted uh, kavya what other things would you patient has vomited four or five times um and she is 56 years of age though appendicitis should be considered as differential diagnosis would you like to consider something else also <clears throat> yes sir what else would you consider <clears throat> sir uh, uh, right iliac fossa pain other in like tuberculosis or colitis iliitis regional yeah and also she is female gynecological causes also i would like to see should be considered yes yes sir. would you like to consider any malignancy yes. intestinal obstruction yes, due to malignancy yes, sir see of the cecum or ascending colon with bowel perforation can also cause sir. yes tenderness yeah you should you right. should not limit yourself see yes, the sir. patient is 20 30 years of age yes appendicitis <laughs> should be on the top but appendicitis still is to be considered but yes. other things also has to be considered Yeah. So Shanai sir, you were yeah. uh, thought. Yeah, I just want to say one or two things. Yes. Uh, for postgraduates, please number your slides so that sometimes you know we may ask you to show slide four, slide eight, slide nine like that. That yeah. is the first thing you should know. And second, can you just go back to one slide before this? Yeah. At the end of this, please develop a habit of writing what is called as a diagnosis. because it is very important i know many times patient come with the ct scan ultrasound report and tell you but you as a post graduate make a habit provisional diagnosis provisional so you are yes. written there tenderness in the right elf okay all right rebound tenderness is present so i would like to consider acute appendicitis as a possibility but however however that then comes the working diagnosis so your working diagnosis is acute appendicitis but that is why you say diagnosis this is clinical diagnosis based on this 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 one other question i would like to ask you other than you said intestinal obstruction and all that thing if you suspect appendicitis what type of appendicitis based on repeated vomiting since you have mentioned and the pain has become very severe you understand the question yes yeah. uh, pavan would you like to answer that you said no repeated vomiting and severe pain so yes hari what type of appendicitis do you think it is okay uh, if you anyway not to delay further i just want your answer is obstructive appendicitis okay. what yeah. i am trying to tell is you know this is a repeated vomiting and the severity of the pain which increases may suggest you two possibility one is a gangrene or an obstructive appendicitis maybe a fecal is there and being an elderly lady also you should consider they go for a perforation yeah based on this and patient is diabetic so the these are the some of the risk factors to go for a early sepsis and uh, that's all ravi shankar yeah my... thank you sir Ka kavya other thing is you have to consider you know though she is probably cannot be labeled as old because she 56 may be middle aged uh, what other feature that she has been diabetic for some time would it alter your uh, clinical you know the signs 
Kavya? Sir, yes, sir. Uh, <clears throat> the tenderness and guarding it may be masked by the guarding may be masked in this age due to that lax abdominal wall and immuno like diabetic and all high sugars did the immuno suppressed. Yeah, correct. So the clinical uh, <coughs> clinical uh, diagnosis may be you know understaging the pathology that is underneath. So that you have to be wary of. You know, I think the extremes of age in children and in elderly, the signs may be deceptively, uh, you know, sort of, let us say, mild compared to the clinical scenario that is going on inside. Okay. Um, Ravi, Ravishan, can I yes, add a, just yes, a small, small point? Because this issue of guarding and rigidity came. We are yes, just sir. in the clinics. Yeah. Just a clarification. Obesity is a definitely yes. You know, it uh, sometimes uh, prevent a patient when you palpate because we don't know the weight of this patient, how obese or whatever. Generally, just because patient has a diabetes, we don't, uh, that guarding rigidity may be present. Yeah, yeah, uh, it is. One, one situation where we tell for the students is enteric perforations. Yes. Typhoid. Typhoid. Yes, sir. In that situation, you know, that uh, books describe that Zenker's degeneration causing uh, uh, some amount of uh, minimal guarding at rigidity. This is uh, just my opinion. Thank okay, sir. Thank you. Okay. Um, carry on, Pavan. Yes, sir. Ultrasound and abdomen pelvic show a suspicious bowel wall thickening in the right iliac fossa with the Mild free fluid level in the peritoneum with fecal loaded colon. That's all. You didn't show anything else? That's all, sir. Okay. Right. Patient suddenly developed atrial fibrillation with heart rate of 170 per minute. As per cardiologist opinion, we give 150 milligrams of amidron bolus and followed by infusion of amidron at a rate of 3 ml per hour and patient admitted to ICU. In ICU on 19th December, patient was on amidrone at a rate of 3 ml per hour and nil orally and IV fluids as monitor as per the ICU intensivist. And there was an increased serum prolactin level 74 and ABG was monitored and- Not prolactin, man. Procalcitonin. Procalcitonin, sorry, sir. Hmm. There was an elevated serum procalcitonin level 74 and ABG monitoring was done and which showed elevated serum lactate levels that is 36 milligram per deciliter. And the vitals are shown which showed there is increased um, heart rate that is 168 per minute. In view of persistent atrial fibrillation as per the advice of physician, cardiologist, intensivist and anesthetist, um, the decision was made to defer the surgery to the next day. The pulse rate of 168 in presence of atrial fibrillation is, uh, is neither here nor there. It is not an indication of uh, this one. The atrial fibrillation may be due to sepsis, but uh, heart rate of 168 does not indicate tachycardia when there is atrial fibrillation. Okay. And CT abdomen and pelvis was done on 20th December 2020 which showed a blind ending dilated um, tubular on, structure. On, just, just a clarification, it was not done the next day. The st plain scan was done immediately after ultrasound and they started giving contrast since they were not sure about the diagnosis. The study was like they took different, uh, 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 like they took uh, two or three, uh, uh, dif uh, different times they took a CT again to assess the, the contrast flow. So that's why they reported it on 20th. Yeah, okay. So we showed blind ending dilated tubular structure in the right ilia fossa with adjacent strandings, um, suspicious for uh, acute appendicitis with uh, free fluid in the peritoneal cavity uh, with the thickening of the andropyloric region of the stomach and thickening of terminal ileum, cecum, and ascending colon with adjacent mesenteric fat strandings um, suggestive of reactive edema or infection. 
so these are the various um, ct abdomen and pelvis with the oral contrast uh, images axial images which showed uh, the image in the slide shows uh, there is a elongated tubular structure with adjacent perinephric standing suggesting of appendicitis and there is a free air in the um, peritoneum uh, which suggests to of hollow viscous perforation and uh, a small bowel feces sent suggesting of ileus and free fluid in the pelvis. Okay. Continue, sir. Can I continue? Yeah, yeah. Now, uh, Abdul. Abdul, are you there? Yes, sir. Uh, if you are now the registrar who is seen this patient and you are you are asked by the consultant to make the decision um, so you have been following the patient and you have shifted the patient to icu and everything what would you uh, what would you think when should we should we operate on this patient should we manage it conservatively given that the patient is in atrial fibrillation what do you think sir uh, in view of the patient in uh, shock and ah. multi organ dysfunction we have optimized patient, started on patient a... was not in shock abdul at the time it's not in shock, shock. yes sir so so atrial fibrillation high atrial pulse. fibrillation that's all yes initially sir. it was blood not pressure low. so af uh, was fluctuating between 160 to 190 pulse rate but the blood pressure was okay urine output was good so you can't say the patient was in multi organ failure multi needs i think only oxygen saturations might be low because of the pain once the pain was taken care of, I think the oxygen saturation must have come, come up. So in view of this situation, now it is established, the CT scan shows that there is free air in the peritoneal cavity with some fluid, uh, appendic acute appendicitis, thickening of uh, ileal loop, cecal, cecum, and significant inflammation in the local area. What would you do? Sir, immediate uh, exploration, sir, after arranging adequate blood and starting on amateur. Why you require blood immediate? Blood but you don't no, require? No, uh, like after going in, we don't know what it is. So arrange everything and proceed. Take a high risk and proceed with the surgery. Okay. Kavya, would you do anything differently? <coughs> sir, uh... If the based on the anesthetic risk also, sir. No, no. Yeah. See, I, there is no major anesthetic risk because the patient is breathing, patient is not being ventilated, patient yes. is putting out reasonable amounts of urine, patient is not on any inotropic support. Yes. And blood gases do not, it should maybe show a bit of my metabolic acidosis with the lactic acidosis. <coughs> you can correct. Yes. So anesthetic risk will be there, but not you know maybe yeah, yes. not that much. So would you what would you do? Would you operate on this patient? Would you manage it conservatively? Given now that the story is is about six days old, and uh, you don't know whether the reliability because she was on some pilgrimage, maybe the pain had started even before that. So this though this. Um, Clinically has not formed an appendicular mass yes. or an abscess. The CT scan suggests that it may be an appendicular abscess. Yes. Would you operate or would you manage this conservatively? I would operate, sir. Right. Sir, can yes, sir. I? Yes, sir. I think from again postgraduate, I want a PGs at this stage, previous day admission and today, they should probably clarify and tell. Have they put the nasogastric tube or not? If they have put the reasons, because there was repeated vomiting, number one. And number two, whether antibiotics. See, that is what is important because atrial fibrillation per se will not produce such a bad metabolic acidosis. Yes. Remember, she has seven point uh, something, three, uh, three eight or something I saw in the previous slide. So keeping that in mind, they should tell that I will monitor urinary output because gram negative sepsis they easily go for a renal failure more so in a diabetes patient so creatinine values and urine output and uh, broad spectrum antibiotics including yeah. metronidazole yeah that's all i want them to say that then take them for surgery yes yes i think uh, you know they, nobody mentioned 
See the thing is meropenem yeah. patient was put on meropenem and metronidazole yeah. creatinine was normal normal urine yeah. output was also around 50 to 70 ml per hour rails tube was put and through which the through which only the contrast was pushed although they she didn't have any more vomiting after admission okay. yeah see the problem is niranjan you are a consultant we want the It's... post graduates to say these things they have not been saying this so that's the thing so you know whether the next slide whatever you are whichever case you are presenting never forget the basics which is you know admit the patient send the patient to icu all these things have to be said you know the iv antibiotics pain management nasogastric tube urinary catheter urine output monitoring these things have to be mentioned uh, abdul yes sir okay so because that is what i wanted you to say when i said what will you do you should say all these things and yes, then yes. make the decision about operating okay hari continue pavan yes. pavan ha ah, sorry pavan continue and sir on 20th december um 20th december 2021 in view of raised um pt inr um we gave two units of ffp <clears throat> and the vitals in which sp spo2 is 96% with nrbm mask with slight elevation in the serum lactate levels so after starting amiodarone uh, cardiologically patient atrial fibrillation reverted and pulse rate reduced to 94 per minute on infusion so patient was posted for surgery after explaining high risk to the attendants we performed laparoscopic release of appendicular mass with peritoneal dilating and laparoscopic converted to open laparotomy with ileocecal resection and ileocolic anastomosis and anatomical repair of umbilical hernia the intraoperative findings were uh, appendic appendicular mass was uh, mass formation with the first part is in the right the video and explain all this okay sir <clears throat> sorry the video quality is bad it was recorded on the mobile so the intraoperative findings as shown in the video in which there is a pus and pus pockets with adhesions to the lateral abdominal wall the pus pockets was noted in the uh, right iliac fossa and in the right paracolic gutter keep on telling what was done yeah uh, sir uh, and this is the ruptured gangrenous appendix uh, with the uh, um, opening and fecolith was noted so this is what dr rajgopal shanai said that yes, this sir. is an obstructive appendix with the gangrenous appendix so this sir. is what you should have said so when is, there was a early mass formation which we could release and then after the release we noted that the appendix had perforated with gangrene and there was a fecolith close to the uh, uh, close at the ruptured area and there was gangrene of the appendix involving the base of the base cecum, of the cecum. Yes. yeah abdul based on the findings that you see here how long do you think this is all going on sir at least uh, a week sir yeah about a week about, roughly i would say about yes. a week looking at all the fibrinous you know exudate and additions to the abdominal However, and bladder however one surprising thing was there was no generalized peritonitis, peritonitis. there was no pus anywhere else except yeah. the right paracolic right. gutter rif and min, some amount of minimal pus in the pelvis pelvis yeah okay there one doubt sir yeah uh, pavan any previous pain i missed there in the beginning the one slide huh? so any pain was there no, the... no history of pass no pass history no, no pass history no pass history okay pavan yes, sir. carry on you yeah. mentioned what was done you mentioned yeah now yes, yes so we performed a diagnostic laparoscopy and adhesions are released and pus drained out and peritoneal dilating was done the gangrene extending till the base of the appendix hence patient made to convert it to laparotomy a transverse midline incision was made in the right iliac fossa and incision deepened and a limited ileocecal resection done and um, ileocolic anastomosis end to end done with 30 pds to lay 
thorough peritoneal wash was given and drains are placed two drains are placed one in the right iliac fossa port through the port in right paracolic gutter and subhepatic space and another one in the pelvic region um, anatomical repair of the umbilical hernia was done and uh, uh, thorough wash given and abdomen was closed in layers okay in what is this transverse midline incision man He just oh, said transverse midline incision. It was a transverse. No, no, sir. Transverse incision, sir. Sorry, sir. Okay, right. In, Because I thought you had invented a new. Sir, new no, sir. In Hari. Yeah. Hari, okay. Right. Now, um, let us uh, Hari. Yes, sir. If you were operating on a patient like this. Yes, sir. What would you do? Ah, uh, sir. The like uh, as mentioned, sir, that is gangrene is extended till the base, sir. So, yes. uh, but at that point, we uh, we couldn't and uh, we can't uh, uh, take away the appendix alone though, because it won't uh, be there. It will give off, give away. So yeah. at that time, we have to go. Ah, uh, we have to convert it to laparotomy, sir. Correct. So and then uh, we have to go to examine the bowel. So uh, extent of gangrene. Ah, uh, have to release adhesions and see. So and then we have to do a limited resection, sir. There. Okay, so would you, you would you do limited resection anastomosis, or would you do just limited resection and bring out an ileostomy? No, sir. Uh, because there is no obstruction. The other bowels are healthy, so we will do do anastomosis, sir. Most uh, most of the time. So If the it is grossly dilated and not able to do it, we can uh, do a temporary ileostomy, sir. The CT scan had suggested the terminal ileal loops were all very inflamed and edematous. I don't know what is the state. Intraoperatively, the status was uh, the terminal ileum for a length of around probably fifteen to twenty centimeter was inflamed. The ah. rest of the ileum was uh, absolutely normal. normal. As I said, there was no generalized peritonitis. Yeah. And one one more important thing, Hari, you missed. When do you do ileostomy? When there was some other peritonitis. Sir, uh, fecal peritonitis. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, it was a uh, sir, Shanai sir. yeah anything what what would you do sir in this situation <laughs> yeah so i think uh, um, all that is fine because put the diagnostic scope and uh, the, there's a gangrene extending to the base yes when in difficulty a situation like this i will definitely open only thing yeah. is uh, since i do not know the type of the patient and other things probably i would have recently also i did one with the midline laparotomy you can yeah. easily manage this not that you should put only transverse incision i yeah. have um, so i i i probably would have done a midline lap that's the only difference otherwise since gangrene is extending only to the cecum probably after a nice wash and other things they would have thought that it's a localized peritonitis so suture probably is safe i think so usually they say in presence of a bad sepsis it is a High chance of a anastomotic leakage. That is what is a uh, usually mentioned. Yeah. So in in this situation, uh, after probably giving a wash, since the gangrene was limited only to the cecum, probably ileocecal limit resection and end to end anastomosis. They have done. So that is the right thing to have done. Yeah. See the thing is, uh, postgraduates, please understand the thought processes behind 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 thinking. how you should when at what stage do you have to think about giving an ileostomy should you do an anastomosis at all should you just bring out both loops so all these things you have to think but in in the circumstances that that has been explained given the patient has been relatively stable has been stabilized before taking the patient to the theater so doing a, a limited resection and anastomosis is fairly safe so there is no uh, controversy regarding that okay right carry one, on uh, uh, there was a thought processor that i probably will get away with uh, just partial cecal resection ah. but that entire cecum was in, inflamed and indurated correct so i felt uh, ileocecal resection will be more safer than just doing a cecal resect partial cecal resection and uh, closing yeah. the suture yeah that is another thing i was thinking of but i think you know the ct scan had given enough in, in, uh, indication to suggest that you know doing a partial cecal resection would be unsafe yeah yeah it's yes, fine i think yeah fine fine only other thing i don't know uh, ravishankar paul you can also think at this stage 
this is a uh, septic case with the two ends end to end anastomosis uh, whether any chance was there staple the both ends and do side to side i just want your opinion yeah um, i think uh, there is a there is um, there are a lot of lot of uh, literature to suggest that a side to side anastomosis is definitely a lot uh, you know safer Uh, for example even closure of loop ileostomy i think uh, they recommend doing a, a stapled side to side anastomosis and they have shown that it is much safer and less chances of obstruction and post operative complications compared to an end to end anastomosis but i think ultimately it is the surgeon's choice considering given the situation and what he is comfortable with i think so if it was an ideal situation definitely side to side anastomosis would have been better since yeah. uh, we didn't anticipate that we might have to resect and it was done as an emergency we didn't have staplers in staplers. Like, yeah. inside Correct. the ot yeah. and uh, i think uh, uh, gurushantha sir also has a question yeah sir i good, good evening sir welcome to the meeting thank you very yeah. much for joining us sir yeah, so far evening. so far we have you know come up to the patient had uh, severe abdominal pain in the right uh, right lower abdomen for four four patient says four to six days probably and uh, uh, vomiting and uh, clinical diagnosis at the time because of tenderness in the and with the rebound tenderness uh, acute appendicitis the ct scan suggested that it was acute appendicitis with perforation and uh, gangrene possible gangrene uh, patient was in atrial fibrillation and that was stabilized and a decision to operate the following day was taken so that is the story and uh, operating wise was found to have uh, probably quite a old peritonitis but localized to the right iliac fossa with a lot of pus but no fecal contamination fecal fecalate in the base with gangrenous appendicitis and the cecum was also base of the appendix up to the cecum was gangrenous so your question that should you have avoided a laparotomy so what do you think sir yeah yeah i could see the video also and uh, yeah i saw ct films and other information yes, uh, ravishankar my only the question was Uh, looking at the scopy findings yeah uh, because uh, the pathology was mainly in the appendix uh, yeah. which already perforated and uh, there was a local peritonitis rather yes. than having generalized peritonitis yeah uh, even though it was extending up to the cecal wall uh, most often uh, the getting uh, the ischemia in the cecal wall is very less likely it is all the inflammation rather than uh, the ischemia of the cecal wall Uh, yeah. when there is a pathology because uh, the iliocolic artery the, the branch the appendicular artery usually that is the one which will get blocked and causes uh, gangrene of the appendix yeah meaning the viability of the cecum may be because of the inflammation it looks like something uh, little scary yeah. but uh, looking into the details of this patient who had atrial fibrillation and uh, other uh, which was managed so still uh, oh, just i may be wrong but i was just thinking was it worth trying just doing transfixation or a suturing of the base of the appendix and taking out everything and uh, giving a good wash keeping a drain and coming out at laparoscopic stage itself yeah, uh, would have definitely yeah 24 hours 48 hours would have seen what exactly is happening in the post op period uh, then would have taken a call off for doing what is next uh, maybe yeah. my thinking yeah i don't I, know i i i you know i think Niranjan answered that question by saying that uh, he was uncomfortable even doing a partial cecal resection because there was significant. I do agree that uh, it does look more probably as you said it is not prone to ischemia, and but it yeah. does look much worse than what it is. But uh, given the situation, I think on tactile feedback, what Niranjan got, he was not uh, comfortable even doing a partial cecal resection, which is why he. Up, opted to go for a uh, you know ileo cecal resection you know, initially my thought process was the same sir i thought uh, yeah. b- because i had mobilized uh, almost uh, the cecum everything yeah, everything i saw in the video every yeah. whole appendix you could catch yeah, and, yeah. Uh, fully mobilized i thought uh, by yeah. just by opening i will feel it and probably extend the uh, excess bit, bit of the cecum where it was gangrenous and close it but once okay. i opened i felt that entire that cecum and the terminal ileum was quite indurated and i felt the taking sutures on that integrated tissue probably the leak rates will be far more than doing it. it will be far more safer to do a ileocecal resection that's why i did the ileocecal resection okay. okay. so 
So and that's why it was like a transverse small incision because the mobilization everything had been done through laparoscopy. Yeah. Okay. One more uh, Ravi Shankar for the post graduates. Yes, sir. Uh, with uh, such a scenario, if uh, things are asked, uh, like what is the minimum possible you should do and come out, looking into the general condition of the patient, if it is asked. Yeah. I think uh, earlier uh, the senior surgeons used to do this, like uh, you excise whatever the inflamed or the pathological fecal wall, put a tube there in the form of cecostomy and come out yes. and wait for some time and decide later what exactly to be after once the patient is stabilized. Yeah. This also, if they mention, I think uh, as an examiner, we do accept looking into the general condition of the patient. Yeah, but uh, sir, uh, Rajgopal Shanai, sir, um, please correct me if I'm wrong, but the morbidity associated with the a tube cecostomy is far worse compared to the anastomosis. That is what the literature says. I, what... I, I can only say that, uh, yes, as far as possible, drain the all the septic focus. Yeah. That is the main principle here. So tube cecostomy, I think nowadays is not uh, followed. So maybe worst situation comes, suture that may expect an endocutaneous fistula. So with yeah. that, we will put it at, come out. Put it because drain and come out. Yeah, put it drain and come out. Yes. Maybe, yeah, tube drain, tube drain. When I say yeah. tube, tube drain, not yeah. uh, cecostomy. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, any doubts in the postgraduates? Any, any questions? I think what Dr. Gurushantapa has told also is an important point that uh, junior people, when they take, probably they may not be in a position to take a decision of doing a hemicolectomy. See, yeah. hemi sorry, when I say hemicolectomy or whatever. Yeah, this is limited resection. Yes. So the idea is to get out of that uh, septic focus as much as they can do. That is the main yeah. uh, principle here. Yes. So I think, uh, and a good wash, and uh, that probably is the minimum thing which one can. Yes, yes. Which okay. amounts to you know, bailout surgery. Yes. Right. Um, Pavan, continue. Yes, sir. In view of atrial fibrillation, decision was made to maintain the patient on electroventilator support. This is the post operative ileocecal resected specimen. Here, there is a ruptured appendix in fecalis. Let's see. The histopathology showing acute appendicitis with periappendicitis consisted with gangrene and features of peritonitis. Okay. Carry on. Yes, sir. On first post operative day, patient was on ventilator with inotropic support. Noradrenaline at a rate of 2.5 ml per hour and amiodarone at a rate of 2.4 ml per hour. And patient is on NPA with IV fluids as per ICU protocol. And the urine output was 80 to 130 ml per hour. The vitals are uh, shown here. There was a continuous fever spike um, that is 100, point, 100 degrees Fahrenheit with tachycardia 120 to 135. Um, and uh, with parabdomen is soft with abdominal drain, right side with 100 ml uh, serous and uh, left drain with uh, uh, minimal discharge. So antibiotics are upgraded to levonidifloxacin and polymyxin. And the investigations um, shown that there is a elevated uh, serum lactate level and X-ray test shows linear opacities in the right lower zone lower, lower of the lung um, suggestive of plate atelectasis. On POD2, patient was still on ventilator with uh, uh, amiodarone infusion and there was a continuous fever spikes and was not subsided and it is around 102 to 103 foreign hits. 102 to 103 foreign hits. And with the tachycardia and parabdomen is uh, soft with minimal right and left uh, drains around 8 to 25 uh, ml uh, serous fluid respectively. And the investigations showed there is a um, high levels of uh, HbA1c that is 12.2% with average glucose levels and serum lactate levels. And um, X-ray test suggestive of hazy opacity in the right lower zone, uh, suggestive of collapse, collapse or consolidation. Pavan, why did you do HbA1c, man? Uh, 
So it was not done by us. It was ordered by physician. Uh, uh, you, didn't, you didn't have to put it up because it is totally irrelevant in this situation. No, no. But our average glucose was very high. Hi, yeah, yeah. So, Agree. Uh, it was like past three months. See, HPA1C and TSH levels in acute situations is spurious and it is probably not uh, very contributory. That's what I meant to say. For pay, uh, I know this is all investigations done by ICU, but students have to realize this. Okay, yes. continue. Yes. On third post-operative day, patient has a ventilator with inotropic support of noradrenaline 2.5 ml per hour with amidrone 1 ml per hour and with urine output 30 to 75 ml per hour. There was a continuous fever, fever spikes and they are not subsided and reached a maximum of 106 degree Fahrenheit. Um, and SpO2 is 91 with ventilator and per abdomen is soft with uh, minimal um, serous fluid from the right and left side. And blood investigations suggest of there is a elevated uh, procalcitonin level and serum lactate levels and chest X-ray shows. Uh, no, no. Uh, for one, for procalcitonin, has it come down or it, it is the high when compared to the first day? Sir, uh, initially on the day it is seventy four, sir, and nineteen. Yeah, so yeah, showing it downward trend. Right? Yes, sir. Yeah. Downward trend. Right? Yes, sir. And X-ray chest um, showed. Patchy opacities in the right lower zone, suggestive of pneumonitis or collapse consolidation. And culture and sensitivity were done of blood, urine, and tracheal aspirates, and pus culture also done. There is no growth was seen. And AFB of the tracheal aspirates and gram stain showed negative. The ultrasound abdomen was done, which showed minimal clear uh, perihepatic free fluid. Um, and no other abnormality was noted. See, um, Kavya, yes. would you do an ultrasound scan in this situation? Uh, sir, uh, just <clears throat> in case to rule out any intra abdominal sepsis foci for. See, the post operative abdomen is very difficult to assess both yes. clinically and ultrasonologically. For various reasons, you would expect some amount of fluid in, to be present because of the significant amount of inflammation and infection that was present with peritonitis. And also the washout fluid is there. Some of the washout fluid will be there. Yes. So fluid being in the abdomen is not going to change in any way your management. And yes. dilated loops of uh, small and large bowel will prevent any visualization of anything you know, significant as far as ultrasound is concerned. But unfortunately, ultrasound is available and it is available on bedside. So you do it. The main reason to doing it is, I think, legal because you have to be seen to be doing something. The judges expect you to do a scan. So yes. that is probably the reason to have done it, I think, because there is no information that is going to help you in the management of the patient. The Rajgopal Shanai sir and uh, Professor Gurshanta Pasar. Yeah, I, I think uh, I agree with you because I think uh, ultrasound has been done very second day, correct? Third day, sir. Third, third day, day, third day. Third day. Uh, third day. So, because uh, that is the one thing which is uh, easily available bedside. The only thing, only thing is uh, here the patient has deteriorated very fast. So, uh, as I understand, this is third day only, no? Yes, sir. Third day. So, so whether patient. Even though CT scan is more specific, Correct. especially this, but uh, probably uh, there was hardly any time. I guess so. When there's such a high degree of temperature, my thing is management-wise at this stage is probably I don't think anything would have done because, as I understand, you have started the antifungal before surgery. Correct. No, sir. It was started on day two because patient had persistent fever spikes fever. starting from day one only. So uh, we they changed the escalated the antibiotics and still the fever spikes persisted. They, it was uh, like relentless. It was go. It was constantly high. So they started antifungal on day two only. Day two. Uh, their suspicion was probably some gram negative sepsis. And doing ultrasound only purpose was even though there were drains, drains were clear. Yeah, I, I they just wanted you. to rule out any other yeah. uh, source. They, like since it. they were not able to localize, only other source was some uh, patchy consolidation in the right lower zone. 
so they were trying to do all sort of things and patient was not stable enough to be shifted to shifted to icu I, uh, ct ct, CT. Yeah. although because uh, anastomotic leak drains were hardly anything there were two drains abdomen was soft even though it is difficult on ventilator to uh, exactly predict what is there there was no gross distension rails tube aspirate was very minimal yeah so the thing is you know basically uh, when i have seen many cases where the legally the judge asks why didn't you do a scan so you know that is probably one of the reasons to probably do it because the information you are going to get is probably not contributory professor gurshanta prasad yeah definitely i do agree uh, doing the usg is not a wrong thing but uh, we should take the report if there is a obvious collection which is showing on so yeah but the yeah. drains were placed not, right drains not were showing in the right places because one in the right paracolic gutter going up to the subphrenic space and other one in the pelvis so and, and the fluid uh, fluid was not significant enough they said yeah. hardly it is around 5 to 10 ml, 10 ml. minimal yeah. free fluid the, uh, one thing post is that uh, sometimes the drain may not drain in the post operative period sometimes yeah, yeah, yeah that was the reason the ultrasound was done because there was no yeah, other exactly. uh, there is no harm uh, absolutely uh, nobody can question yeah see uh, one point revision yeah, yeah, that get the report if if there is a if there is a leak which happens within 48 hours if you look at this scenario it probably is a surgical technique related and yeah. we don't expect that to leak ha and happening within two days and patient dying to this level see yeah. that is something and that after doing a thorough laparotomy and uh, rather the septic focus all that has been removed it, it started yeah. in fact immediately the fever spec started immediately on oh. the night of surgery like yeah uh, uh, from okay. the day, day one i have only one question to ask you whether it's a hospital policy i i need to agree on that whichever hospital you are there there is some policy why did you start the patient on meropenem on that admission itself initially it was initially the patient was on uh, cefepirozone and sulbactam okay, okay, okay. but I the think, icu uh, people they escalated the next day because they suspected uh, sepsis yeah of course sepsis part is uh, very clear so i what i am trying to tell is that actually uh, sulbactam uh, so that it was cefepirozone sulbactam when the patient was admitted so the probably the next uh, i mean stepping up generally they go for a tg cycline and uh, then followed uh, of course later by uh, of course culture sensitivity and all that thing um, so that, that's all i just wanted uh, for these are depends upon the uh, hospital it was policy. basically ICU. the antibiotic policy was a uh, icu uh, driven okay, icu intensive care yeah okay continue pavan Yes, sir. And post on third post-operative day, persistent um, uh, high-grade fever up to 106 um, degrees Fahrenheit with uh, antifungals also started very conazole. In view of bradycardia and low blood pressure, patients started on triple inotropes, noradrenaline at a rate of 25 ml per hour, adrenaline 25 ml per hour, and vasoprilin at the rate of 2.4 per hour, you know, 2.4 ml per hour. At 5:30, at 5:20 p.m., there was no central pulse, and CPR was initiated as per ACLS protocol. And in spite of all resuscitation efforts, and patient was declared dead at 5:42 p.m. Yeah. Um, the cause of death in this case is sepsis with multi-organ uh, dysfunction syndrome. um you know, due to appendicular mass with abscess secondary to perforated and gangrenous appendix uh, status post exploratory laparotomy and ileo cecal resection and anastomosis and patient is a um, type 2 diabetes mellitus and hypertension okay yes, sir uh, now given the situation given the unfortunate uh, result in the end um hari would you have done anything different to the whole course of events we have discussed no sir uh, i feel it is fine sir i, I would have followed this sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. okay abdul nothing else everything no, has no. been no, no, not no. nothing else would you have done anything differently no sir that's what sir okay. nothing kavya mm -hmm. nothing sir no, that i can think of indraja would you think of anything to do differently in this situation no sir okay uh, now i think i will come to the two stalwarts uh, <laughs> professor gurshantha prasad would you have done anything differently sir 
yeah nothing uh, ravi shankar but uh, finally we we did not know the cause for septicemia in this patient uh, because uh, uh, nothing has uh, shown that there is a leak in the drain the only serous and uh, volume was very less and abdomen in the post operative period even though on ventilator uh, mentioned it was uh, nothing suggestive of uh, peritonitis so where was the sepsis and the abdominal sepsis was taken out by doing surgery yeah and the present sepsis in the scenario was from the basal lateral excesses hmm so in spite of having a anti fungal coverage and higher antibiotics so we don't know we, unless we find out where exactly was the source of sepsis uh probably the cause of death uh, is uh, difficult to explain in this patient yes sir so there was two things going on one from because she already came with sepsis even though we drained the uh, pus everything she probably was already in sepsis and the fever spike started on day 1 the other possibility because she was on a pilgrimage and it was during this starting of this uh, peak third wave although we did covid rt pcr rapid it was negative i don't know whether there was an underlying covid because even by the time we thought about it third day she was already uh, dead so the sepsis probably precipitated because uncontrolled of uncontrolled diabetes and late presentation already she was in sepsis when she presented whether uh, it was refractory to all the antibiotics and all that we can we cannot tell so because there was no nothing else uh, where we could have done any other investigation to find out any other source of sepsis so the uh, other possibility thought process was whether there was actual covid we don't know so you felt probably the pre operative before intervention what sepsis she had it she, continued she, to be a operative period and resulted in multi organ failure okay. sir rajgopal chennai sir what are your thoughts no i i have uh, just one or small message to post graduates basically that uh, i have seen in my practice since many years whenever there is a biliary sepsis even i have seen after lab cholecystectomy there was a there was a leak whatever within one hour of shifting from the uh, post operative uh, i mean ot to post operative ward patient went in for terrible cardiac irregularities and patient is if your patient is 50 year and typically diabetic and all there is a tendency that we put the blame in the heart and cardiologist this is a my, my very close observation sepsis is something which you know that uh, when there is a septic focus uh, the priority should go to the sepsis no doubt here that uh, 160 pulse rate it is good that uh, you have brought it down to 94 what we call as optimization since the patient has come very much delayed as uh, lastly you have put that refractory that is the one important point here i doubt that atrial fibrillation you should write as a cause of death in the sense it is not the cause of death what i am trying to tell here is that it is a severe sepsis only there is no question about that so it is the mors only refractory hypotension and everything so with uh, resulting in a appendicular mass and abscess gangrene and all that thing so point is biliary sepsis and this appendicular sepsis and all cardiac irregularity are very much known so that is one message for pgs secondly i still don't know about this uh, whether it uh, antibiotics in this patient because you are not able to get a proper culture for uh, in any one of this in the post operative period so yeah. that is, these are the only two comments otherwise i think there is a, a surgical wise she has come operated and uh, what has to be done it has been done i doubt that, i don't think the leak is a cause or something like that correct that's all i can say right um i think uh, basically uh, go to the review of literature now um, how one quickly yeah yes sir can i start sir yeah yeah yes sir uh, so mcluhan et al conducted a prospective observational study in hospital mortality in patients undergoing urgent uh, abdominal surgery during acute peritonitis complicated with sepsis in this overall um, that a day hospital mortality rate was 40% and um patient with a significant um septic shock is around 69% and urgent laparotomy is associated with significant increased risk of mortality and it is approximately around 
and mortality in intra-abdominal sepsis ranges from 28 to 47% and these are the various significant variables in 30-day mortality as shown in the table. And Hessen Kelly uh, conducted a uh, study on mortality and morbidity in appendicitis in the elderly patients more than 65 years and which was an observational study um, in which uh, these are the various high morbidity etiological factors in elderly patients as shown in the table and the perforation uh, rates was high around 40 percent and out of which uh, 378 patients uh, more than 65 years uh, um, patients who underwent appendicectomy was 112 patients um, out of which uh, um, perforation rates and morbidity were 40 percent and 28 percent respectively uh, so the final conclusion of the study is elderly patients show high perforation rates and morb morbidity after appendicectomy and Omari et al. conducted a retrospective study um, on acute appendicitis in elderly patients and the risk factor for perforation um, in which uh, the incidence of appendicial perforation in acute appendicitis is estimated to be 20 to 30 percent and it increases in elderly patients more than 60, per, 60 years is 32 to 72 percent. The high rate perforations in elderly patients is due to late and atypical presentation, delay in diagnosis and surgical intervention, presence of comorbid uh, conditions, and age-specific uh, physiological changes. The mortality rate in elderly patients following perforated appendicitis was between 2.3 to 10%, and death is often related to septic complications. And delay in presentation to hospital is associated with higher rates of perforation and post-operative complications. And one more study was conducted by Lynn et al. Um, uh, risk factors and mortality associated with multi-drug resistant gram-negative bacterial infection in adult patients following abdominal surgeries. In this study, out of 6,720 patients um, under, um, who underwent surgery, of this uh, 4,176 patients underwent abdominal surgeries. And in this three, uh, 625 patients with positive bacterial culture and 364 patients with gram-negative bacterial infection. Of this 364 patients, uh, non-multi-drug resistant gram-negative bacterial was 247 and 117 patients were multi-drug resistant gram-negative bacterial infections. So the patients with MDR, uh, multi-drug resistant gram-negative a bacterial infection was the significantly uh, longer ventilatory days and hospital stay with higher 30-day mortality when compared to non uh, multi drug resistant gram negative bacterial infection and have a mortality rate was high around 56% in patients with multi drug resistant gram negative bacterial infection and one more study conducted by Lane Jays et al uh, uh, to evaluate the use of ileocecal resection for immediate treatment of the advanced appendicitis uh, so uh, which showed that it's a definitive treatment of advanced appendicitis and can be performed by resection of involved area of ileocecum. And this can be accomplished by with the primary anastomosis, alleviating the need for ileostomy and secondary operation. Thank you, sir. Right. I think the fairly comprehensive review of the literature. Um, so let us start with Hari. What is the take home message? Sir, uh, uh, we have to uh, rule out the patient with, I mean, first of all, starting with the uh, pain abdomen, sir, the evaluation, quick evaluation, and uh, management in ICU, and de decision about the surgery, uh, when to do, and uh, even with that uh, conversion of open and lapros laparoscopy, when to convert everything, sir. And then, um, and in this patient, uh, the uh, cause of sepsis and uh, maybe early admission would have been saved the patient that. That is what I am thinking. So these are many uh, things I learned today. Okay. Kavya? Sir, uh, earlier, like early presentation and early recognition of sepsis is very crucial to manage before the patient goes into refractory shock. Hmm. So, uh, um, uh, yeah. Um, so, Professor Shanai, sir, your, your final thoughts? Hello. Yes, Am sir. I audi audible? Yes, yes sir. 
yeah i think uh, basically early diagnosis is the main thing in uh, all these cases number one and uh, number two always uh, whenever a patient comes with the right electrophoresis of pain and uh, you said no, no guarding no rigidity and all see whatever said and done our clinical assessment may be very very highly subjective what you should go by is the septic part of this patient you know she had a very importantly severe acidosis i was pointing out to you on that day one when yeah. she when you have done so that was probably a actually a reminder to tell that intervene fast that is what first thing i would like to tell yes with 164 pulse rate i also would have married her with a cardiologist to come down to whatever uh, this one but uh, back of the mind always remember the that septic part has to come out fast but, yeah and uh, one antibiotic related things that uh, may be an important thing to check again the type of antibiotics which are used that's all yeah yeah thank you sir professor gurushant prasad yeah definitely i do agree like if it is a complicated appendicitis i think we should be more careful we should not take it lightly and earlier the better you want to the patient also early like uh, taking the advice or the treatment and we also as a treating surgeon early intervention and early diagnosis of complicated complicated appendicitis yeah Uh, and uh, doing the procedure also post graduate uh, what uh, they should learn is uh, no appendectomy should be taken lightly uh, every case you should take it as a new case and every case you should feel that yes we are going to learn learn something out of that particular case and see that all of us are in, irrespective of our age and number of experiences and number of cases done so no appendectomy should be taken lightly that's what you and i convey to my post surgeries uh, two surgeries minimum small surgeries uh, in our uh, general surgical practice one is appendectomy second is circumcision they should not be taken lightly so we should be serious attentive and uh, give the best possible outcomes uh, to these procedures yeah. definitely yeah good sir i think that's a uh, very good niranjan your final thoughts sir nothing much everything has been covered uh, yeah. only thing probably if the patient would have presented earlier probably we might have had a better result yeah. and with respect to intervention uh, when the patient presented uh, uh, had a sudden af in the, from emergency even before shifting to icu and uh, within 12 or 13 hours of the presentation we have operated in the morning after optimization yeah so uh, that that much only apart from that antibiotic uh, usual antibiotics what we start for appendicitis was started and was escalated as per the icu protocol so the, that much only probably uh, i i couldn't think of anything else what could have been done are you thinking sir yes sir yeah one more uh, just for the post guys i have i keep these uh, maybe i call it uh, as a dictum uh, whenever we have a medical problem during a surgical emergency yeah careful either we should be very selective in doing surgical procedures or have a reliable the colleague of your person for the medical line of treatment see that everything is given to the best possible yeah uh, like when there is a non surgical disease associated with surgical emergency the surgeon should be very careful, careful. In, in yeah so i my final thoughts are i think the you know i think most of it has been covered the major thing is the patient probably had the problem much you know longer than what the history suggests as evidenced by the the se- severity of peritonitis even though it was localized if you look at that it doesn't look like a 3 or 4 day old peritonitis it looks probably much older than that so the if the patient did not the ct scan did not suggest presence of air in the thing still i think surgical option would have been the only way to deal with this because uh, ct scans do not predict gangrenous appendicitis so gangrenous appendicitis is only visualized by the laparoscopy or at open surgery so hence do not get lulled into thinking that you know you can manage these patients as long as the patient is clinically stable you can if it if there is a mass you could probably manage it conservatively but otherwise surgery after optimization is very you know i think the standard line of treatment 
i don't think any other uh, intervention uh, or lack of intervention has contributed to the unfortunate event of death in this patient all uh, the measures that were supposed to be taken were preempted and taken so sometimes you know despite our best efforts we do lose patients i think proper counseling of the patient all through uh, throughout the process is again keeping the patient in the loop and so the relatives in the loop so that they are aware that the, you know you are doing everything possible but the patient's condition is deteriorating so again proper communication and documentation of the communication is also very critical i think a uh, lot of good lessons to learn i think uh, we have to uh, probably not congratulations not the word we have to uh, you know compliment niranjan for a proper management of this patient despite the uh, unfortunate uh, event in the end so with if there is no other comment we will uh, say good night and uh, thank you everybody for attending thank you thank you good night sir thank, thank you sir good night thank you sir good night gurshantapore namaskara namaskara sir namaskara sir